I'm going to um, speak about the act of writing, which is something that every researcher has to do a lot. And the good news is that some pretty simple things can make your written output a lot better. So that's why I titled this Seven Simple Suggestions. So here we go. Seven simple suggestions. Here is the first one. Don't wait. Right, this is what uh, mistake that a lot of people make. Here is a typical plan for doing research. Number one, have brilliant idea. Number two, spend months doing good research to back it up. Number three, write the paper in the last two weeks before the deadline for the conference. This is a bad plan, right? Here is a good plan for doing research. First, have an idea. Second, start writing the paper. Third, use the paper as a forcing function to make you do the research that articulates the paper. Okay? You see how different this is? Right? It means you start writing very early. Why is this good? Well, I often find if I've spent invested months of effort hacking around and writing code and, and thinking, and then I start to write the paper, then I realize that some of my previous work was misdirected. Right? It wasn't directed to a useful goal, certainly not for that paper. And I also discover some key parts of the paper that need more work. Right? So you want to use the paper as a, as a forcing function to learn that early. It also gives you a good way to communicate with other people. Research is all about communication, right? If you, if you're the, maybe you're the kind of person who likes to work just on their own in a windowless room with no lights. But I like to work with other people. I spend a lot of time at the whiteboard. If you have something written, you have a new mechanism for communicating with them, right? It's very important. It's a mechanism for communicating. Uh, that's all a long way of saying that really writing is not the way in which we just report research. For me, it's a way in which I do research. And I think you should think about writing in that way. It's not just the output, it's the computation. It's the stuff that makes research happen. And it's because somehow we think more clearly when we write than when we just think. At least I do. So, um, one problem with this plan here is that it starts with this idea bit, right? Where does this idea come from? And so, uh, it's tempting when you're looking at other people's work to think, oh my, Everybody else has very clever ideas, and I am a mere worm, and I have such trivial, boring ideas that nobody would be interested in them. Hey, do you know that feeling? Yeah? You sit there and you don't feel very creative. Let me tell you that this is what every researcher feels most of the time. There are days when you have that miraculous breakthrough, and you really, you know, your God is in heaven, and you know that all is right with the world, but most days you think, I am a worm. This is the natural state of the researcher, right? So what you have to realize is that even, you know, Tarjan and, and so forth thinks that he's a worm most of the time. And what, what researchers do, good researchers, is they simply start writing anyway, right? They write a paper about any idea, no matter how trivial or insignificant it may be. My experience is that the cleverer the research student, the more they are prone to this failure mode. Either they don't understand something, in which case they're depressed, or else they do understand something, which they believe, in which case they think it's trivial and nobody will want to know about it. Right? So in both cases, depressed. This is not a good situation. Right? So just write an idea, no matter how insignificant it seems to be, because my experience consistently is that when you write the paper, your idea develops and ramifies. Computer science is like a, a snowflake or a flower. You start with a little seed, and it sort of ramifies ahead of you into interesting things. Something that looked boring turns out to be actually rather interesting. Not always. Sometimes you'll start writing the paper, and it turns out indeed to be weedy and insignificant. And then maybe you won't publish it, but it'll be done quickly, and you put it on your home page. All right? So, write early. Write early. And, and I really do believe that this second thing is, is much the most common case. It almost invariably turns out to be more interesting than you thought. All right, number two. If you're going to have this idea and write about it, you need to be clear what it is. The business of writing a paper is to convey from your brain into the minds of your readers your idea. So think of your paper as like, like a virus, right? You're trying, to, you're trying to infect your readers' minds with your idea. And then it will infect them. Then they'll talk to other people and it will infect them. So it's like a kind of contagion or plague that is going to sweep the world. And everybody's going to be thinking about your idea because it's so, well, infectious. Right? So uh, the, um, I, my, my, my analogy here with, uh, with Mozart is just that uh, here, hundreds of years after Mozart died, we are listening to people read his papers or 
more precisely, play his music. We actually go to concert halls to hear his papers because their ideas were so infectious. Don't you think that's amazing? Wouldn't it be remarkable if in 400 years' time people were still reading your papers? It's not all that likely, but I think that, that's, the, that's the kind of idea that you'd like to get. You're, you're, the paper is not a mechanism for getting promotion. It's a mechanism for conveying ideas from your head to somebody else's head. If you don't convey them, right, if you don't bother to tell anybody about your ideas, then you might as well not have them. Right? Even if Einstein had sat in a windowless box and not told anybody about relativity, then we wouldn't know about relativity. Right? That means you need to know what your idea is, right? So when you write a paper, in the end, at least by the time you've finished, you must know what is the idea that your paper conveys. It's surprising how hard that can be to determine from people's papers. As a reviewer, if you read somebody's paper, when you've finished, you can say, what idea did that paper convey? If you find that hard to articulate as a reader, then, you know, you, in your review, you can say, I really couldn't figure out what, this, what the idea this paper was about. And so then you apply that to your own papers. Right? It's actually sometimes quite hard to know exactly what your idea is to begin with, but you must know by the time you've finished. Uh, if you find yourself thinking, oh, well, actually, three ideas in this paper, then what you do? Just write three papers. Right? Rather than trying to wedge them all in, in which case each one becomes cryptic and incomprehensible because you try to squidge it into ten pages, just write three papers. That's cool. Right? That's not salami slicing. That is taking ideas and expressing them. A good, good idea in your paper is to say explicitly when you get to the main idea. It's surprising how seldom this happens. So I often try to write phrases in my paper that, that say at the beginning of section three somewhere, the main idea of this paper is this. Because I've had to explain some context and setup and background, and I want it to be absolutely clear when I move from describing the context to saying, here's the payload, right? The virus is about to arrive in your brain. Prepare. Does that make sense? Right? If you don't say that, if you leave your reader to be a detective so that subsequently they have to reverse engineer what they think you meant was the key idea, that's not good, right? Why not say it explicitly? Be completely upfront about this. Third thing, tell a story. So if you're going to write a paper, and this applies, I'm focusing mainly on papers, but I do also mean dissertations and so forth. Everything applies to everything you write, really, is to tell some kind of a story. I always try to imagine when I'm writing a paper that I'm standing in front of a whiteboard and explaining it to a colleague. It's amazing how differently people will present things at a whiteboard than they will in a paper. Right? With a whiteboard, they'll start right away with examples. They'll explain it quite differently than if they, they will not. Yeah, well, you, you get the idea. They, they often explain it in a much more accessible and engaging way at a whiteboard than in a paper. So if you want to be accessible and engaging, do the same thing in the paper as you do at the whiteboard. Nearly. You need to have a bit more substance. So here's a narrative flow that I usually try to follow in my papers. Right? You want to say, here's what the problem is. You want to motivate your reader to say why it's an interesting problem. You want to say, at least briefly, why it's an unsolved problem. So it would be worth solving, and it's unsolved. And then you want to present your idea. That's the payload, right? Virus has arrived now. Right? And then you give quite a bit of detail about exactly how, what your idea is and how it works. Um, then you're going to say something about um, uh, how your idea compares with other people. So you're kind of trying to lead people in. Remember, not everybody will read right the way through your paper. Your ideal is that wherever anybody stops reading, they take away something valuable with them. And moreover, every bit they read makes them want to read more. Right? This is back to making it accessible. Right? So you know, they say, ah, oh, here's an interesting problem. I wish I could solve that one. I wonder whether he can solve it. So they've, you know, they've got the hook. They're inclined to read some more. Um, so here's my uh, uh, sort of typical outline for most papers that I write. And indeed, it works for dissertations as well. Short abstract, um, an introduction, then something about the, um, uh, stating what the problem is, then quite a bit, a bit of a short piece explaining what the idea is kind of intuitively, and then a longer piece explaining the details behind the idea that sort of fills out the evidence, then something about related work. And I'm going to say a bit more about each of these sections in the following piece, but this is my uh, picture of how the structure of a paper might go. And look at the numbers of readers, right? More people will read your abstract and title than will read all the rest of the paper. So each time you want to give them a hook to continue. Here's what I think your introduction should do. One page, describe the problem briefly, and articulate what your contributions are. So here's some, um, by way of example, um, describing the problem. I would suggest you introduce your problem with an example. So my uh, crude way of doing it is to say, is there any typewriter font on the first page? I'm a programming languages guy, and programming languages people tend to put example programs in typewriter font. 
So I know if there's typewriter font in a paper, it's probably an example. That's good, right? But in your fields, it may differ. But anyway, start with an example that illustrates your problem. So here's an example of a paper that I wrote some time ago. And the very first thing I did was give a little program and explain a problem with it and explain that somehow my paper was going to fix this problem. Okay? So that's an initial hook. Not a general description of a problem, but something rather specific. That's my suggestion. Then you may want to generalize a little bit, but in, in stating your problem, I think it's helpful to be not too ambitious. So some people state problems that are like Mount Everest. Uh, here's an example. Uh, computer programs often have bugs. It's very important to eliminate them. Many researchers have tried. Uh, it's really very important. Now, what have you learned from this introduction? Right? Do you think, fantastic, this paper is the one I'm going to read because it's going to tell me how to fix bugs? No, you think, here is a general observation that everybody would agree with and that you could, you know, it's like motherhood and apple pie. Nobody could disagree with this. Do you see what I mean? Or another way to say it is, he's posed the problem that thousands of computer scientists have worked on for a hundred, well, tens of years, and it is never going to be done anyway, right? So do you see why that is not a useful thing to say? In that introduction part, this is the part which you still have your 100 readers, right? And they're, but they're busy falling off. They're dropping like flies, right? Every sentence that goes by, another 10 readers have died. You know, they've sort of fallen off. So you, 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 you have to kind of use your, your precious words at the beginning, those gold-plated words at the beginning, to hang on to them. So don't give them this garbage, right? Instead, uh, here's a kind of uh, counterexample. Here's a, so here's a particular program that shows a particular kind of bug. Right? And my paper is going to show you how to catch or automatically nail an interesting class of bugs like this one. Do you see it, how that feels different? Mole hills, not mountains. This seems counterintuitive, right? Because usually we're told to frame our work ambitiously, but don't frame it too ambitiously, or people will just won't believe you. That's what it amounts to. Okay? So that was the first thing. Describe your problem. So you've got about you know, a little half page for that. Then you want to say what the contributions, contributions of the paper are. Now, this is really important, and I think it's worth... Uh, worth writing a first draft early. You write a first draft of your contributions, and you go back later and rewrite them, and then you go back later and rewrite them. But you need to know what the first draft is. So the list of contributions drives everything you do in the paper. It says, it's like the claims that you make. You say, in this paper, I'm going to substantiate the following claims. One, two, three, four. Right? And uh, every claim forward references to some evidence, and the idea is that your reader reads these claims and thinks, Crumbs, if he could really do that, that would be quite cool. So they have to be crisp enough to, to be um, understood by a reader and, think, and have that thought. Now, uh, here's an example. Um, I usually uh, write claims like this using bullets because as you're reading that first page, remember your readers at the moment are not committed to your paper. They're just thinking about it. People's eyes are drawn to bullets. They just read the first bit of each bullet, right? So for every contribution, I have one bullet. Right, this is all going to fit on the first page. So after some introduction about the problem, I'll then say, you know, in this paper we put the choice on a firmer basis, or in this paper we make the following new contributions. That's typical. For, and then lay them out. One, two, three, four. Bullets. And for each bullet, look what I've done here. Right? Explain precisely blah, blah, blah. Section four. We do this. Discuss these effects, section five and six, and contrast them in section seven. So for every claim I've made, I've given a forward reference to evidence in the paper that supports the claim. So page one is like the specification, and the rest of the paper is like the implementation. So for every bit in the spec, you give a forward reference to the implementation that substantiates that specification. You with me? This is great, because now, if a reader thinks, ah, I wonder if that claim is true, he knows exactly where to go to look. And if, if a reviewer at the end is looking back at your claims, having read the paper, he can say, yep, tick, yep, tick, right? That's much better than asking them, them to do detective work, to say, I wonder where this third claim is substantiated. Oh, well, when I say evidence, I don't necessarily mean theorems. It might be measurements. It might just be argument. It might be sort of just sort of more details somehow. So evidence, I don't mean, I mean a, a sort of slightly woolly kind of thing, but something to make the reader believe that you're right, whatever form that takes in your field. Are you with me here? Idea, contributions. Or sort of problem, contributions. You may not have enough space in the introduction to say very much about your idea. You're almost asking them to say, well, here's the problem. Here's, here's the properties of my solution. Now you're really motivated to learn my idea. So don't try to present the idea on page one, because you won't fit it, is pretty much what it comes to. Okay. 
one other thing about the contributions bit, which I missed out here, is that you want to make your contributions refutable. That is, it must be possible to fail to deliver on them. If your contributions say, you know, we described the WizWars system, well, of course you'll describe the WizWars system. No reviewer can say he didn't meet his contributions here, but you've described it. You know? And if you say we're going to study this, well, of course you've studied it. But it's not very interesting merely to describe something or to study something. You want to make refutable claims or claims that have some actual content. So think celery, not soggy, overcooked pasta. Crunchy. Crunchy, refutable um, uh, claims. And I've just given a couple of examples here. Now, uh, last thing about the introduction. How many of you read this paragraph when you read papers? You do. You read it. Oh, yes, but do you read it? Do you think, what a great paragraph. I wish I'd written that paragraph. I'm reading every word with care and attention and love. No. You skip it, don't you? Because you're going to read the paper, right? What the dickens is this? this? This stuff on page one is simply a waste of that precious bandwidth you've got with your readers, right? It seems like the right thing to do to give an outline of the paper, but I promise you, nobody reads it and it's occupying a column inch on your most precious page. Instead, just do what I mentioned earlier and give these forward references. Right, if in your um, stuff here you've forward referenced all the section, you have done everything you needed. You've simply given a narrative that incidentally forward references the paper, which makes this stuff entirely redundant. So just don't do it. Very strong advice here. <laughs> Related work. Many papers go like this, don't they? They have introduction, related work. And why not? Everything we do builds on stuff that people have done before. So it seems like the right scholarly, well-justified thing to do to first of all go through the related work and then a couple of pages later we're now ready to see the new stuff. That feels sort of kosher. That feels what proper researchers should do. But what actually happens in practice, the related work forms a kind of barrier or sandbar or concrete wall between your reader and your idea. You're going to drag your reader kicking and screaming through two pages of stuff that they don't really understand before they can get to your idea. And why don't they really understand it? Well, expert readers will. Right? The people who are really in your micro part of the snowflake will know what you're talking about. But you would hope to bring with you many readers who are perhaps not in your little tiny corner of the world, but are from a broader part of computer science. So if you assume that they already know quite a lot of stuff, you're not going to um, uh, make much progress. Now, the thing is that you might think, well, OK, so explain it well. But if you explain it well, the related work section drags out longer and longer. So what happens in practice is, because people are eager to get to their idea, they take this related work concrete wall and they kind of squish it uh, until it's the density of lead, right? Because they try to make it short and therefore it's cryptic and incomprehensible. So, they, you know, here's a, a, a sort of random example here. And, you know, some reader reading this just hasn't a clue what's going on. They've never heard of brown, white, or green. They're really not very interested, right? They want your idea. So it feels good, but actually it doesn't work very well. Another difficulty is that at this stage in the paper, you do not have very much uh, notational scaffolding. You have not built up a set of intuitions and terms and a sort of world view that enables you to discuss this stuff very easily. Moreover, you haven't introduced your idea, so it's very difficult to do any comparison stuff here too. Um, so my strong advice in papers at least, and I think actually mostly in theses as well, is just to, um, uh, to leave it until the end, right? To do this related work stuff right at the end. Now at this point at the end, you have, um, you have incidentally, as you've gone through, you've referred to related work, but you haven't made a big meal of it. And at the end you say, now we're going to compare what we've done to other people. And there you have all the intellectual scaffolding that you've built up, all ready to go. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that you should ignore every piece of related work and pretend, make it seem as if everything until this section is all your own work. No, no, no. As you, it's like if you were going at a whiteboard right, with somebody, you would not say, first of all, I'm going to give you a section on related work. You would instead say, here's my example and here's how I tackle it. Oh, and by the way, this, idea, this, this bit of the idea came from this guy, but I added this new bit. 
right? And at that point, you wouldn't go into what this guy did. You just say, you just give the credit to him as you go by. Do, do you see what I mean? So in your paper, as you explain your idea, as if at a whiteboard, you give citations to relevant related work, and perhaps you even say, oh, and we're going to discuss more of that in section eight. So every time the expert reader is reassured that you are not a stupid idiot who has not read the literature, you know all about the literature, it's just that you're gonna get there at the end. See what I mean? People disagree about this. Your supervisor may disagree with you about this, but this is what I think. Now, uh, second thing about related work is when you are writing, this bit at the end, right, the, uh, the, the, the section towards the end here, you, um, uh, you're then trying to compare your work with other people's, right? Now, a common fallacy, seldom articulated explicitly, is this. In order to make my, my work look good, I have to make other people's work look bad. Right, so you say, well, in this completely crappy work by uh, Fred and Blig, they did this stuff and it was really no good and ours is better on every dimension. Right? So, there's a kind of human instinct that makes you think in order to show how wonderful my stuff is, I have to somehow downplay, not as crudely as that, but somehow downplay other people's work, right? But happily, the truth is that it's not like that at all. Credit is like love. Credit is a commodity that is infinitely divisible. If I have 10 pounds and I give you five pounds, how much do I have left? Five pounds. If I have love and I give you love, how much love do I have left? Oh, as much as I ever had and maybe more, <laughs> right? So there you are, and credit is just like this. You can say very nice things about other people's stuff. Obviously, not, don't be syncophantic, right? Don't praise them because you think they're going to be your reviewers and you must be nice to them. Praise them because they are good, right? So if you read a paper that you did find inspiring, make a moment in your paper to say, it was an inspiring paper. Why not, right? That will encourage other people to read the same paper, which is a good thing, right? It makes more goodness in the world. It will make the authors feel good about it. It gives credit where credit is due. Everything is good about this, okay? So um, just be very generous to other people. And believe me, this will not make your work seem worse, right? So of course, there are going to be some ways in which you're going to say, but we improve on their results in the following way. That's fine, because you've been, you've been generous to them, and then you said, but, but in this dimension at least, we're a little bit better. Um, or maybe way better, who knows? You just give the numbers. Um, another thing that's really important is, if there are weaknesses in your approach, like if you're better on dimension X, but worse on dimension Y, if you only mention X, you are inviting your cruel reviewers to point out that on dimension Y, you're really not as good. It's way better if you point that out. It's quite disarming for your viewers who are already, you know, they're thinking, ha, 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 but he's not so good there. And then they say, oh, but we're not so good here. They're thinking, oh, right. right. So uh, be, it's, not, it's not just honest and scholarly. It's also good tactics to explain that you're perhaps not better in every dimension. And that's often, you know, things are often a compromise, right? Maybe your approach is simpler, but the performance numbers aren't quite so good that might be a trade-off many people might be willing to make. And your paper might be very interesting, despite, you know, that it's not, it doesn't run quite as fast, or something. You see the point? Okay, we're on number, what are we doing? We're on number six, putting your readers first. What does that mean? The first way in which you should put your readers first, it relates to this, um, the middle section. So the middle section is in some ways the easiest to write. It's the longest, but it's the easiest to write, because this is where you are presenting your idea and giving the substantiating evidence um, and writing out all the details, right? So this, is, this part is the bit we're all uh, trained to write, and uh, also it's kind of easier to write because that's, that's the stuff that's in your head. So, but there are a few things when you're thinking about your readers that you might want to consider when you're doing this section. Number one, when you're developing an idea, you often develop it through examples. When you're presenting an idea, it is very common to see this kind of stuff. You know, consider a bifurcated semi-lattice D over a hypermodulated signature S. So, the, in other words, after you have learnt the general solution to something, it's very tempting to present the general solution first, and then perhaps to give an example or two to illustrate how wonderful your general solution is. The trouble is that it's not motivating to your readers. 
because your readers do not have the intuitions that you have carefully built up by studying this problem. You're just hitting them between the eyes with this sort of monster statement that they do not understand at all. So motivated readers may fight through, but the rest of the readers will just fall off the horse and we start reading the next paper. Okay? So what do you want to do? You want to do what you would do at a whiteboard, right? You would explain the intuition first. I don't know how to say it more emphatically. Explain the intuition first. Do not give the general story right at the beginning, right? otherwise you'll lose your readers. And uh, one advantage that has is that if a reader gets an intuition for what your idea is about, then if they leave the paper when they get to the gory details, they're still taking something valuable away with them. Whereas if they leave the paper when you tell them this, they have got nothing valuable. They've just simply felt stupid. And making your readers feel stupid is not a good plan. Now, how to convey the intuition? Well, the way we all convey the intuition when we're in conversation with our friends is we instinctively give examples. That's the very first thing we do, isn't it? We can't help ourselves in conversation. And yet in papers, we almost can't help ourselves from giving the general case first. It's very bizarre. So just give into examples first. Give several examples of the, the problem that you're trying to solve and, and examples of how your idea solves it, right? So by the, by the time the reader is coming to the more general statement of your idea, they have something to anchor it on. So this is when I'm beginning to set the scene in more detail for a paper post called Scrap Your Boilerplate. I give a particular example of the problem that I'm trying to solve and, sh and begin to show specifically how my solution tackles it. But for a particular program. This was about generic programming. So I said, supposing I wanted to have a generic program to compute the size of a data structure, no matter what data structure it was, then this is the kind of code that I'd like to write and, and worked on from there. Now, when you get to the more details, it is tempting to carry the reader through the path that you took. In research, it's full of blind alleys. Right? So you walked down one blind alley, you discovered it was, it was a dead end, so you walked back out again and you walked down another one. You walked back out, and this is the nature of research, isn't it? Now, does the reader want, to, um, want you to carry them down the blind alley? Look, there's a wall ahead of you. Let's go into another one. Oh, another wall. Right? And of course, every step on this path is soaked in your blood. Right? But it took you a long time to explore this stuff. So you think, oh, the reader is going to be really interested in my blood. Right? They're really going to want to know. But they don't. They're fundamentally uninterested. They want to know the answer. Now, sometimes the blind alleys are so obvious that you have to say the obvious solution does not work, and I'm going to explain why. But very frequently, I have read a paper, and I have slogged through a page of quite technical material only to find that the reader says, the, the writer says, this approach does not work. I'm going to tell you a better one. And I'm thinking, I have just burnt an hour of my life following you down this blind alley. Why did you do this to me? You laugh, but it's true, right? It actually happened. So don't do this to your readers, right? Just choose the most direct route. Exploring only the blind alleys that are so obvious that it would be, you know, the reader will simply not follow you down the good path because they'll keep thinking, but look, it's like, you know, if you see, if you're trying to jump into a swimming pool and you see the swimming pool there and somebody says, let's go around this little um, circuit, they think, let's just jump in, right? So if it's that obvious, you have to tell them, but that's all. Okay, number seven, listen to your readers. What does that mean? So I talk about be nice to your readers, and once you've been nice to them, you then want to listen to them. So find guinea pigs and get them to read your paper. Now, what's a guinea pig? A guinea pig is a friend of yours who is willing to do you the honor of reading your paper. So it's like inoculating them with a drug, right? And you see whether they fall over dead or squeak or what they do. But you only have a limited supply of guinea pigs, right? So if you inoculate them all with the same paper, then you don't have the opportunity to recycle them. So because once they've read it once, they're kind of immune. They will never be able to read your paper again for the first time, by definition. So don't use your friends up too quickly. Use them kind of one at a time, or maybe two at a time. The other thing is, you need to explain very carefully to them what you want for them. It's a, my experience is constantly that if I give a paper to a friend of mine and say, you know, would you be kind enough to read this for me, what they will tell me is, this word is misspelt, there's a comma missing there, the grammar in this sentence is not great. Did I want to know that? When my paper is 99% complete, absolutely yes. But at every previous stage, absolutely no. 
what I want to know from them is, I got lost in section 3. Do my friends tell me that? You bet they don't. Because they feel stupid, right? They got lost in section 3, so they think, oh, well, Simon's expert friends will all understand that. You know, I'm just an idiot. But that's not true, right? They are your guinea pigs. You are trying to find where they get lost. So you must tell them very carefully and in unmistakable terms, what I want to know is where you got lost or where you got unmotivated or where you thought it's not my worth carrying on. And then because they're a friend of yours and you may be nearby, you can get into the room with them and you say, well, where did you get lost? And they say, it's here. And you can say, well, suppose I explain it like this. You get on the whiteboard and often 10 minutes later they say, oh, now I understand. Why didn't you say that? And you think, oh, why didn't I say that? So when you're in this dialogue, try to listen to yourself to see how you explained to your friend how to get over that little bump. And then instead of, uh, and, and then put that explanation in your paper. See what I mean? In other words, don't treat it as being an exercise in you educating them in how stupid they were. Instead, treat it as an exercise in you learning from them what would be a good way to explain it. You see the difference? It's a very big difference in attitude. Now, as well as your friends, you can also try to get help from uh, true experts who are further away. Now, this is harder because they don't have any, any personal stake in your life. But one way to hook them can be this, right? So you send them a draft. This might be somebody who's in your related work section. You say, I've, been doing, you know, I've studied your very interesting paper about X, and I found it very inspiring. It's be better if this is true, right? I found it very inspiring, and I've, written, and I've developed you know, the, the following idea in some way. And uh, here's a draft of my paper. I wondered if you might be interested. And particularly, you know, I've tried to do a fair job of explaining your work in the related work section. And um, if you cared to look at it, I'd love to hear from you. Something like that, right? And then, if I receive an email like that, I think, oh, they've cited my work. Cool. So I look at the related work section. And then before I know it, I'm sort of back in the details. And then I think, oh, I'd better send them, send them some response, right? So, it's, um, so even um, uh, it can be a way to get some feedback even from the very people who might end up as your reviewers. Don't overdo this. Right? If you deluge people in, um, who you don't know in, uh, in, in drafts of your paper, they'll, they'll just get fed up and they'll treat you as a parasite. Uh, so, but judiciously and in very extreme moderation, you know, just uh, maybe again talk to your advisor, it's a very reasonable thing to do, I think. <clears throat> And furthermore, if they're going to uh, shoot down your paper and say, it's complete junk, right? it's much better to have them do it before they are your reviewer, right? which they probably will be. Better hear it now than later. Last thing about getting feedback. Um, you've got to treat every review and bit of feedback from your friends. So from your friends, it's easier. When you get the review from your submission from the journal or from the conference that says your paper is rejected, and by the way, here are some reviews, you will be bleeding because your paper has been cast in the dust, right? Puked upon by these ignorant reviewers. And you read the reviews and you think, they're just stupid. They have no idea, right? They just missed the point. Very occasionally, you'll be absolutely right. Much more frequently, it's more constructive to think, how could I rewrite that section so that not even the stupidest reviewer could have misunderstood it in that way, right? That's a more constructive response. Also bear in mind the fact that your reviewers have devoted, have given to you a gift that is more precious than gold, namely their time. They, every person has a fixed amount of time in their lives and they have given you one hour of their time. They cannot have any way of recovering that hour. They have given it as a gift to you. So don't treat it lightly, right? Be grateful to them. Thank them in your, um, you know, in your comments and try to take account of what they say. You have to leave it a few days, bleed for a few days, and then go back to those reviews and see what you can do. Great. Thanks for being such a good audience.